being withdrawn and the foreign aid that is there is sometimes somewhat problematic and predatory. Uh, it's really grabbing up natural resources that are available in these countries. Um, you know, their oil was discovered off the coast of Liberia and you see a lot of countries moving in to take advantage of that and the money not necessarily going back to Liberia. So there are a lot of issues that are happening within these countries still, uh, you know, with colonialism and, and abuse of the, the natural resources by outside forces. Um, within these countries, there's a huge amount of mental health problems. So a representative survey in Liberia was conducted. Uh, you know, this is probably a decade ago, but I don't know that it's gotten a ton better during that time. Where 40% of adults were, uh, you know, endorsed symptoms that were consistent with major depressive disorder, and 44% of adults uh, had symptoms that were consistent with a post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis compared to 7% of the US. So you can see that the rate, the difference there is, is just orders of magnitude larger, uh, the, the amount of mental health problems that are, that are experienced in these countries. Um, it's estimated that 400,000 Sierra Leoneans have a mental disorder, but only about 1% of them receive any care for these disorders. And that the mental health infrastructure in these countries is almost non-existent with only one psychiatrist in Liberia um, two in Sierra Leone. I was told it's one and a half psychiatrists because one of them is about to retire. Uh, and then there's one psychiatric hospital in each country. So when we think about the impact of the war, um, you know, particularly in Liberia, the majority of youth have been exposed to high levels of violence with more than half reporting that they've lost a relative in the conflict and about you know, close to, to two thirds having had their homes damaged or destroyed and more than half suffering a physical injury during the war. 33% uh, of youth report having been associated with an armed group, uh, whether that was serving as a, a child soldier, uh, serving as a porter or some other sort of labor within uh, these, these fighting groups. But this is one of the places where the emergence of child soldiers really uh, caught the global attention. Um, and a third of these were female. So there's a high rate of sexual violence, which happened during this time amongst both male and females, amongst these armed groups, with 33% of males and 42% of females reporting that they have experienced sexual violence. All right, so transition from the history now and talk a little bit about uh, the impacts of this kind of violence exposure and, and trauma and how that affects uh, individuals who, who are exposed. So when we think about the traumatic stress cycle, uh, we start with a traumatic event. This could be war, this could be a car accident, this could be a natural disaster. In this context, we're really focused on violence. But as I've worked in these areas, uh, you know, it's interesting that both in Liberia and Sierra Leone, when we talk to people about traumatic experiences and things are exposed to. A lot of them report the Ebola epidemic as, as the most traumatic thing they've experienced because during the war, you had a targetable enemy. You knew, you knew who the enemy was, but with Ebola, you, you didn't see it. You didn't know what it was. You didn't know when it would strike. And they found that even more traumatic than, uh, than, than the war a lot of people did anyway. Um, so there's, there's just a host of different things that, that we could talk about as the traumatic event. Now, after exposure to a traumatic event, uh, we usually have some sort of uh, response of fear or guilt or shame or grief, depending on the type of trauma. These experiences are not very comfortable. We don't like to feel afraid and we don't like to feel ashamed. So we avoid these kinds of experiences. Um, we try to find things to, to push them away and to not have to deal with them. Now, unfortunately, we're kind of hardwired, uh, our brains try to address this. You know, when, when we have something going on that, that's causing us pain, we wanna take care of it. And so when we avoid it and push it away, it starts to come back through what we call intrusive symptoms, nightmares, flashbacks, um, uh, memories that we don't want to, to have. They come back into our minds and, and remind us of what's happened and start the cycle over again. So we come back to the fear, to the shame, to the grief. And again, we want to avoid it and push it away. So this, this is traumatic stress cycle is somewhat you know, natural and normative. 
if we, we use it to sort of titrate our exposure and deal with things in small doses and, and small amounts so that we're able to cope with uh, the, the negative emotions and the grief and so on. But if, if it becomes too much, so it overwhelms our system and the avoidance becomes too, uh, you know, too extreme, the cycle can actually become really entrenched and, and turned into what we would call post-traumatic stress disorder uh, or, or other types of, of stress disorders. Um, and so we, we really want to try to address this cycle before it becomes you know, entrenched. Another thing that happens because this is not a comfortable experience is people become depressed. They don't like this. This is, this is hard to deal with. And this, this sort of chronic uh, stress of you know, this the traumatic cycle going on causes people to become depressed. So we also think about this as a link to a lot of maladaptive behaviors. Uh, so rather than really trying to effectively deal with the, the fear, the guilt, the shame, and the grief, we often have it lead to behavioral problems. And this, because a lot of the work I do is focused on HIV, uh, the, the behavior that I focused on here is sexual risk. So when we're dealing with uh, you know, fear and guilt, things we don't want to, to experience, we sometimes seek empowerment through doing risky things. Um, you know, that we actually, as, as you know, I work a little bit with the VA, uh, you know, in substance abuse, and we do see a lot of, of veterans coming back from overseas who, rather than sexual risk, although that is something the veterans engage in, they'll do other types of risk behavior like gambling or reckless driving or substance use. Um, and a lot of this is about seeking empowerment. And when you come to the avoidance, because we want to not have to fill these kinds of experiences, we seek escape. How can we not have to fill this or experience this? Um, and then with depression, we have lack of self-care. All of these things can lead to things like sexual risk behavior, uh, substance use, other types of, of you know, behavioral issues that can cause problems for us. So when we think of how to address this, you know, a lot of the, uh, you know, the trauma treatments that we have are really trying to address uh, the fear, the guilt, the shame, and the grief, and to find some resolution to this. And we, we often call this processing, cognitive processing. We really want to try to find meaning. We want to take this, this uh, you know, these, these experiences and put them into our sort of lived experience, our, our sort of personal narrative in a way that's meaningful, that, that allows us to resolve these kinds of, of experiences. And often this is done through exposure. Uh, so a lot of our frontline therapies for traumatic stress uh, or what we would call it exposure therapy. Um, so one thing that I, I kind of like to, to uh, relate this to is if you think about uh, like an electrical wire, a live wire with electricity running through it, um, this electricity running through the live wire is sort of like the traumatic memory, this traumatic experiences, the, the traumatic uh, emotions that, that travel along this wire. Um, and when we get close to it, we get shocked. And that's just not a comfortable experience. And so we kind of have a few things we can do to try to, to fix this so that we, you know, we can kind of try to bleed electricity off of this wire, which actually involves getting in contact with it or the exposure. The other thing that we can do is we can try to insulate the wire by, by wrapping it in something. In this case, we wrap it in the narrative. And so the trauma narrative, the cognitive processing, the exposure are all sort of approaches to addressing this, this negative emotion that's, that's kind of running through the, this live wire and, and trying to make it so that we can deal with this, this charged wire that's, that's going through us. Um, when it get, becomes too much, avoidance can be adaptive. Uh, so the, the problem with avoidance is it can be maladaptive, but we can keep us, block us from resolving it. But if we can find adaptive ways to avoid when we're being overwhelmed and avoid being overwhelmed, but, but not fully believe being able to, to resolve uh, you know, the, the traumatic experience. That's what we mean by adaptive avoidance. And so a lot of times when we're starting treatment for uh, traumatic stress, we, we don't start with let's, let's expose you to your traumatic memories. We start with let's create a safe space. Let's really work on some stability uh, and really helping you to, uh, to um, regulate your emotions. We teach a lot of skills 
um, you know, motion regulation skills, distress tolerance skills, uh, diaphragmatic breathing, ways to sort of reduce arousal before we go anywhere near trauma. And then social support is another important component of this. And so finding ways, you know, if, if you find that your family and friends really can't help you with this because they don't understand, then find a support system that can help you. So with veterans, having a veteran support group um, and so on. So we, we really work on trying to hit all these, these kind of levels with, with our interventions for traumatic stress. Um, when we're working in Africa, there's a lot of stigma around mental health problems. So that that's, becomes a barrier for us. There's also uh, a lack of trained mental health workers and a, a real lack of, in, you know, what we might call safety net or, or supportive services uh, that can help us if things start to go wrong in treatment. And, you know, because of the lack of, of you know, of a mental health infrastructure and system, uh, there's also sort of this lack of stability. There's, there's, there's a lot of issues that, that are what really keep us from wanting to use exposure-based therapies when we're working in Africa. The system just isn't set up to support um, what we might think of as frontline treatments uh, in a more developed country just because of the, the lack of infrastructure there. Um, so because of this, we've kind of moved to some alternative ways of thinking about treatment. We like to do this in a group setting just because, uh, you know, because of the lack of resources, working in groups is, is less resource intensive. Uh, it also provides the social support like we talked about in the, the prior slide. Um, and it can be really useful to help break stigma around mental health problems when you're with people who have similar problems and you can see that, uh, you know, you have support from them and that um, you're not alone. And, and so I think there's a lot of reasons why groups are really effective in this environment. Um, so we, based on everything that I just talked about, uh, the, the sort of approaches of addressing traumatic stress, uh, working within this, this low resource environment, we developed a group intervention, which we call the youth readiness intervention. Um, and we frame it more as a youth development program as opposed to a youth mental health program, again, because of the stigma. Uh, it's uh, to maximize resources. Uh, we've made it a group. We really have stayed away from um, exposure and we really focus on stabilization. Uh, we're really teaching some of these stabilization skills, um, partly because that's really, you know, where there's a, there's a real lack of that uh, to start with. And then secondly, we don't want to go into exposure just because of the environment. Um, so we really focus more on teaching affect regulation skills, motion regulation, coping skills, problem solving skills, interpersonal skills, um, things that help to build this sort of sense of safety and stability, uh, which if that's established and persists, will allow some of the more natural, uh, naturally occurring work to happen around trauma just through time. And, and uh, you know, as people get to, to, to a place where they feel like more stable and more ready uh, and have sort of a support network, that can help to, to have the trauma resolve naturally. Uh, although, you know, I don't want to say that it's it's just going to resolve naturally because a lot of times it really mental health intervention is needed, but but I think it sets the stage for a more healthy recovery by starting with the stabilization process. So this is kind of uh, our model that we we use to, to, you know, we based our group treatment on. Um, we have three kind of phases that we that we kind of work through. The first is really this sort of sense of, of stabilization, establishing safety, teaching affect regulation skills. Uh, then we move into more of what we call our integration phase, where we help to start talk about how do you cope with things? What are adaptive ways to cope? We really focus on the present. We don't go back and talk about traumatic events that have happened. Again, because there's really not a safety net. If something goes wrong and someone gets re-traumatized or triggered in a group, we don't have a place to send them to help. You know, we're, we these programs really are frontline and safety net. So, so we really focus on current events. How do you adapt with what's happening now, uh, or how do you cope with what's happening now, um, and stay away from from trauma and exposure. And then in phase three, we move back to what we call connection, where we really start to work with social support and relationships. Um, you know, so so that's kind of the model that we work. Through. We also 
have uh, across all phases um, this sort of idea of, of health protection where we we really talk about substance use, sexual safety, stress reduction as being important in all phases. We also look at socialization. Uh, we want to help people with, you know, because of stigma, uh, and we want to work on um, empowerment and interpersonal skills, uh, working with the shared experience within the group, and so on. So this this is the model that we, you know, that our, our youth readiness intervention is based on. So we've taken this intervention, which we we really there's there's a, a much longer story we could tell about, uh, you know, years of uh, preliminary work that we've done and and a, a big. Uh, longitudinal study that's been done with former child soldiers, which uh, really set the stage for us uh, knowing what to target with this intervention. Um, but that, that's a whole other story. For now, we, we did take this intervention, we pilot tested it, we kind of worked out the kinks, and then we did a clinical trial in a school setting, in an educational setting, uh, through an Educate program. And in this clinical trial, we, um, we recruited 436 war-affected youth. We uh, randomized them to a community care comparison condition or our YRI group uh, intervention. After they finished this phase of the study, we then randomized uh, within these two uh, groups at this, this sort of mid-level, we randomized each of these uh, conditions into uh, an education waitlist group or an immediate education program. And so half of the, the youth who had the, the YRI intervention moved on into the Educate program. The other half uh, were waitlisted and then started the Educate program a few months later. So we could get a sense of not only how does this group do on mental health, just as a standalone mental health intervention, but part of our goal here, as you know, the name of the group would suggest, youth readiness, was to prepare them for future programs. So we wanted to be able to prepare them to function better in an educational environment. And so we, we would then wanted to test how well that worked. So what we found, just some, some of our, uh, you know, a selection of our outcomes, uh, that emotion regulation improved significantly with youth in the, the YRI, uh, pro-social behavior improved significantly. Um, what we, a few follow-up findings, we had really high retention, 85% of youth at six months. Um, we did find that a lot of our mental health uh, outcomes sort of dissipated at the six month follow up. However, for our most distressed youth, they continue to show better outcomes. Um, you know, if you, if you compare their starting point with distress, their, their magnitude of their change really persisted. And, and so we, we feel like we, we at least had good persistent mental health outcomes amongst those that were the most distressed uh, or had the most severe symptoms at the beginning of the program. However, our more exciting uh, findings for us, I think, were that our eight-month follow-up period teachers uh, in the Educate program who are blind to uh, participant, participant condition, um, uh, they, well, first of all, more of the YRI youth and control youth were attending school at the eight-month follow-up, uh, so 28, almost 30% versus 5%, which is, you know, the odds ratio of 8.9%, which is huge, um, and that the youth who went to through the YRI program had better attendance and academic performance than the control youth, and this was rated by teachers who were blind to, to youth intervention uh, condition. So based on these findings, uh, this, this, uh, these education findings in particular uh, interested uh, the World Bank, they interested the, the Sierra Leonean government, they interested uh, other development players, uh, including the German government. And so we've moved forward with uh, a, a new study, and this study, coming back to our implementation science uh, slide here, really was focusing on how do we take this, this intervention that we developed, which showed uh, some evidence for efficacy, and how do we implement this scale it up and implement it on a broader scale. And so a big part of what we're looking at here is what kind of strategies can we use to help this implementation become more effective and then end up with, with similar rates of, of outcome. So what we're currently doing um, is a 
hybrid type two scallop study. So this, this by hybrid type two, we're basically saying we're looking at the implementation science uh, outcomes, which you know, we, we have in this box here in the middle, as well as clinical effectiveness kind of within the same study. Um, and we're doing this across three districts, three rural districts of Sierra Leone. And our, our aims here, we have our implementation aims, which are to uh, really look at uh, this, this strategy of collaborative team approach uh, for being able to scale and sustain mental health programs. So we have an actual um, implementation strategy that we're using. Um, now we wanna look at internal or organizational level uh, variables, as well as external or community, political, societal level factors that, uh, that impact the integration of our uh, youth mental health program. And we're actually doing this now, instead of with an ed educational program, we're doing it in youth entrepreneurship programs. Uh, the German government is running a, a, a big youth vocational training program throughout Euro, uh, rural Sierra Leone, and they wanted a psychosocial component to this intervention. And so, you know, they, they liked what we had done in, in the educational sector and wanted to integrate that into their uh, youth employment programs. So we're, we're sort of helping them with the psychosocial component. They're running the vocational training component. And so now we're looking at how well does this work? How well does it work to integrate a mental health program into uh, a completely different sector um, in youth employment? And then we also want to look at our, our clinical effectiveness. How well did we do with uh, improving motion regulation, functional impairment? And then we also want to look at economic outcomes. So again, my slides are busy, sorry. Uh, GIZ, which is the German, it's essentially a USAID uh, through the German government. Um, so they're, they're running the youth employment program. Um, we're working with a, a Sierra Leonean partner. Um, basically, our, our goal is to teach. So we're working with Caritas Freetown um, to train them to actually run the psychosocial component. So we're not actually doing it. We're, we're sort of like the, uh, you know, a, a consulting group that's trying to teach local organizations how to do this and letting them run it and then partner with the German government in, in providing this service. Um, so that's, the, and then this, this is all, this, it's a very complicated, we, we have the National Institute of Mental Health funding our evaluation of the program, the German government funding the vocational program, um, and then the, the Sierra Leone government and the University of Sierra Leone and Caritas Freetown running uh, the psychosocial element. So there's a lot of, of players in, in this program. Um, this little map of Sierra Leone here, which I've got my stuff in the way of, I'll pull that over. So we, we did a pilot study of this, all this in uh, Pailaun out here, this, this bottom orange part. Uh, the, the full scallop study is happening across all three of these. Uh, so Koinadugu, Kono, and Kailaun. Um, Freetown, the capital, is out here on the coast. It's a challenge to get out to these areas. This, this is very rural. Uh, it's not very developed. Um, we've had all kinds of fun with, uh, you know, trying to provide supervision and doing assessments when we don't have any internet connection out there. Um, but this is where we're operating. So we, this pilot study we did was, was done in Kailaun. Uh, we did it with, uh, you know, we, we trained six uh, community work, health workers to deliver the program. We did it with 171 youth. Um, we went through and, and really looked at the feasibility of this. Uh, so we had uh, 65 men, 106 women in this pilot. Uh, you can see our age range is around 22 to 23. Um, education level, you know, not many were currently in school. Most of them had had some education. Um, what we found is with females, uh, we didn't see a whole lot of difference. Our control females um, had worse outcomes, but but we didn't see a whole lot of difference between just the education or the, the employment program and the, the YRI plus uh, the employment program. For men, we actually did see some significant differences. Um, 
one of the things that we we kind of one of our takeaways from this is that this this did have some impact among men among uh, women we had a lot of barriers a lot of the women had children a lot of them didn't have the ability to get to the training um, so as you can see here at the bottom here 81 percent of females reporting having at least one child which turned out to be a, a barrier for them engaging in the program which I think you know is, is part of why we didn't see much difference in, in the women um, thank you for calling me I appreciate it after for all you're tired from teaching What was that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what are you teaching? I thought that was a question. Okay. Uh -huh. No, I think I'm trying to mute. <laughs> it's, it's all right. Um, so one thing, though, that we were actually kind of excited about with our pilot was that we did see some labor market impacts. Uh, what we saw was that youth who went through the the youth readiness intervention, they actually increased their uh, hours in wage work as opposed to self-employment and agriculture. And while they ended up working fewer hours per week than uh, comparison youth, they actually ended up making $48 uh, of you know more, of which in Liberian, or sorry, Sierra Leonean money, that's that's a good amount of money. Um, so we, we actually saw that we, we had a shift in the type of work people were doing and how much income they were making over this pilot period. Um, so, so that gave us some, uh, gave us some, at least some evidence that what we were doing may actually be a good pairing with the vocational program. So after our pilot, now we're working to, to scale things up and, and really do this hybrid uh, effectiveness implementation trial. And, you know, kind of as our, our pictures here show, it is a challenge to get out to these rural areas. That's our team uh, out in the field. Um, and you can see the roads are, are not great, <laughs> to, to put it lightly. And in fact, there are times when we have to have uh, motorcycles or canoes to get to some of these areas. So um, it's a challenge to work in these areas, but it's been an interesting project. Uh, so when we look at our enrollment and screening, um, we've screened, you know, over a thousand youth in each of our districts, uh, and found that, you know, 864 in Kailan were eligible, 760 in Kono and, uh, 575 in Quinnadugu. When we look at enrollment and our, you know, our randomization, we, you know, we stratified our enrollment, uh, so we had reasonably comparable numbers, um, of around 380 in each condition, so a total of uh, 1,151 youth who are enrolled. Um, along with the youth enrolled in the study, we also enrolled third-party reporters who could comment on youth functioning beyond just youth self-report. So these were uh, sometimes were uh, employers, sometimes were um, youth, uh, uh, sorry, community leaders, uh, you know, village chiefs. Um, so we we really tried to find at least one third party reporter for each of the youth that we enrolled in the study. Um, and then we also have our, uh, our facilitators for our programs, uh, agency leaders who, who provided um, data for us on uh, sort of the organizational side. So our collaborative team approach, this is our sort of implementation science or our implementation model that, that we uh, are implementing. Um, you know, this, this is really, uh, we create a seed team that's trained to do the, the program. And then that seed team, which isn't us, which is, is the, the team from Caritas Freetown, then goes out and trains the clinical teams in each of these districts. And um, they do these plan, do, study, act cycles where they really are meeting regularly to, to identify challenges to come up with solutions, implement the solutions, uh, collect data on how the implementation is going. And as, as these changes are having effect, they then will circle back around and, and revisit how they're doing. Uh, so this happens internally for each program. And then we do cross-site learning where each program then meets um, and shares learning across programs. Um, the, the goal here is to have a number of teams that learn from each other and that we really have the 
the local ownership of the program, um, as well as uh, local learning being transferred between sites uh, with our, our Caritas Freetown, which again is a, is a local team, providing supervision and facilitating this process. Our goal with this is that um, you know, this will increase sustainability because we'll have on the ground people who are expert in running these programs, as well as sort of a community of engagement and um, you know, cross-site learning to help the, these kinds of, of uh, organizational changes and, and um, delivery of services persist uh, after the program ends. Um, we, this is kind of similar to the, uh, the Plan to Study Act cycle. This is where our, our interventionists will audio tape their intervention. Um, we, we try to have them uploaded it into Dropbox, which means that often we have to have people travel to other areas to find internet access. Uh, we have our, our uh, clinical team review these, um, the audio recordings. Uh, we have them rate them according to, to our fidelity guide. We have then our, our weekly supervision, which um, we, we, ended, we tried to do it uh, remotely. We tried to have our, our field team and then a, a Freetown team. And we just found that there wasn't good enough connection for that. So we actually ended up sending our supervisors into the field, um, which you know, then we have transportation challenges. Uh, but it, it was the only way to actually have regular supervision is to do it in person because it just, there just wasn't enough um, you know, electronic capacity for that to happen with uh, you know, the unreliable internet that, or on the non-existing internet in these areas. Um, and then we, we kind of have this feedback loop so that we're always able to be improving uh, the program and providing feedback and allowing uh, learning to be transferred across sites through our supervision. Um, some of our barriers that we found to, to this site or this program, uh, you know, again, as I, I kind of talked about it is, you know, the, the lack of infrastructure. Um, there's, there's really just not a lot of funding available for this type of service within the Sierra Leonean government. And so again, you're seeing these international players like the German government, like the National Institutes of Health, like the Catholic Church and Caritas um, coming in and providing these services rather than them being uh, provided, funded, and, you know, and, and, and provided by the, the Sierra Leonean government. And that, that's a challenge for sustainability um, another challenge that we ran into is that a lot of these services are through short-term bid for contract work and that the, there's a lot of competition for these contracts. And so rather than collaborating, we found a lot of the local partners felt like they were in competition and they didn't want to share information because then they felt like that would put them at a disadvantage for the next co uh, contract that came up. So there was a lot of this sort of competition versus collaboration that we had to work through and, and really try to work to build bridges and um, build collaboration as opposed to, uh, you know, this sort of sense of, of com competition that, it, that tends to exist in these environments. Um, and we also found that most of the Sierra Leonean government's focus for mental health reform and, and just providing mental health services is focused in Freetown. And um, a lot of that in, on the, the uh, you know, their psychiatric hospital, um, which it needs it. I mean, there, there's definitely a huge need there, um, but they're totally, you know, this focus on Freetown neglects the, the rural areas. And we really saw a, a lack of infrastructure and a lack of focus on developing that infrastructure. And then a real lack of research capacity uh, so these were all barriers to implementation. And one thing that I didn't put on here that, that turned out to be a huge barrier for us was COVID, um, which I think, you know, everyone recognizes as a barrier. But uh, our 12-month our follow-up, actually, we weren't able to do because of COVID. The, the grant ends um, this year, uh, you know, January or December is, is the end of the grant. So as of January, it'll be over. And NIH basically said, you know, with COVID and the, the travel uh, barriers, they're, they're not going to let us have an extension. They're just going to say, let's, you know, what you got is what you got. And, um, you know, and so COVID did turn out to be a big barrier for us. 
uh, in, in completing this project and in, in being able to get people out into the field. Um, so sort of, sort of some of the takeaways for us are that, uh, you know, that, that these kind of evidence-based programs are really helpful. And I think we have preliminary evidence now that, that providing these kind of, of mental health programs in education settings, as well as in vocational settings, can improve people's performance not just on mental health outcomes, but but on broader societally imp impactful incomes like education and employment. Um, and so as, as there's a focus on human cap capital development in the Sierra Leone government and, and through the World Bank, these kind of programs should get attention, you know, of integrating mental health and, and psychosocial programs into uh, human capital development. Um, so we, we really see that schools, workplaces, vocational training, and even communities are, are good settings to, to really focus on for mental health programs and services. Um, and that, that these kind of programs are actually a really innovative way to address, address the lack of resource that exists in these kind of low resource environments. Um, so that's, that's kind of one of the big takeaways for us and in, uh, in hopefully you know, we'll, we'll have data to help support that and, and that'll be kind of our, uh, our dissemination plan over the next while is, is to try to get this message out that, that these can these kind of programs can be effectively integrated, you know, mental health can be integrated into education and, and employment programs, and that these can be useful ways of developing human capital, which might go beyond just focusing on, on the teaching a vocational skill, but teaching these sort of psychosocial skills and coping skills uh, really can improve people's ability to um, to benefit from the vocational training and educational training that can be provided. So here's some of the, the collaborators in this. It's Boston College, University of Georgia, uh, GIZ, the German government, uh, in Innovations for Poverty Action, the University of Sierra Leone, the University of Liberia, Caritas Freetown, with funding from the National Institutes of Health and with partnership with the government of Sierra Leone. Several, uh, several ministries, Ministry of Youth, Ministry of Mental Health have been involved in this. Uh, and that's our team. So thank you. We will pause now and see if there are questions. I don't know how much time we actually have. I, I was aiming for five o'clock, so I think I'm, I'm okay on time. Yes, we have at least 10 minutes for Q&A. So please go ahead, either put your question in the chat or just go ahead and, and ask. Everyone's ready for dinner. So Ned, while, while we wait for people to ask, I'm going to ask something about uh, the costing of, of those interventions, because I, I know you mentioned one of the barriers was you know, funding and sustainability. Did, have you collected any data that sort of speaks to the cost or cost effectiveness of, of those interventions? We have, we, we have, uh, we actually, um, have one of our partners is an economist and we have uh, from the Innovations for Poverty Action, they're, they're doing a lot of cost effectiveness work with this. So they've, they've got some models that are really looking at, um, you know, both employment type of, of outcomes as well as, uh, you know, sort of just uh, socioeconomic status. I'm trying to think of the word they always use. But uh, so it's, it's, they have employment as well as just, you know, sort of the factors like, uh, you know, people's living conditions and things like that. Uh, and then as far as cost to deliver the program, they also have data on that as well. We don't have outcomes on that yet other than, than what they've presented for the, from the pilot study. Um, so for the main trial, we, we, you know, are still looking at the data for that. Okay. And that's, that's beyond my skill set. So I don't... I, I don't have a whole lot to say until they tell me. Yeah, that would be interesting to see. So I, I see a question in the uh, the, the chat. Uh, so the age, ages of uh, youth were, youth is kind of a fuzzy term in in uh, West Africa. Um, youth can, you can be considered a youth up until into your 30s if, uh, 
if you haven't moved out and gotten a job and becoming become self-sufficient and so on. Uh, for this, though, we were really looking at 18 to 24. Um, you know, there are some issues with people not really knowing their, their actual birth date or year. So we, we kind of let people decide for themselves if they fell within that age range and weren't, weren't too uh, particular with that. But that was kind of our, our focus was within that kind of 18 to, to 24 year, year range. Um, all right, let me see if I can pull this chat window up to where I can actually see it. Um, so yeah, language and culture. We we did a lot of work to to culturally adapt uh, this intervention. Um, you know, and, and thinking about so like one of the things that uh, you know we, we use a lot of of local metaphor and, and um, phrases and you know uh, when we when we look for examples we would try to find things that were that made more sense in the local context. So a lot of times when we talk about anger management, we we talk about a thermometer. And as the, the red rises in the thermometer, that's your anger until it gets, you know, to the to the exploding point. Um, you know, and, and we were kind of, as we were, were working through this with our local partners, they're like, well, you know, the temperature here doesn't vary that much. We, people don't necessarily look at, at thermometers that often. Um, what what might make a, you know, a better example would be boiling water. And so you, you as you watch the water start to bubble and boil, and then it starts to churn, and, and think about that as a metaphor for anger. And so we did a lot of work with, with around that to try to find ways to express our ideas that would fit the local culture better. We did this all in, uh, there are a few local dialects, Kono's, uh, you know, we have a, a, you know, that was translated into, some of them don't even have written uh, language. So we had to kind of have translators who would help us with that. But um, so we, but we did very much you know, put a lot of effort into making sure that it was culturally and linguistically appropriate for our population. Um, so yeah, we did have, so our, our the, the question was about uh, you know, dealing with re-traumatizing and how do we deal with, with uh, you know, situations when that might happen. And, and honestly, not only did our youth sometimes get, get triggered, but so did our interventionists. And so, yeah, we did do work with, um, you know, how do you address, uh, you know, traumatic experiences that come up in the moment and how do you de-escalate and um, how do you work with, you know, having support and making sure that people have the right connections with someone who can uh, provide some oversight. So our supervi supervisors were on, on standby and we did have them contacted a few times with, you know, an emergency case and having to, to work with the local clinician about how to address things. Um, we did do some, you know, training with our, our team about how to manage distress uh, and provide some sort of, you know, as you say, psychological first aid. Um, and then as, another question is on measurement. Yes, we did we did do a lot of work around culturally adapting our, our measurement tools and really trying to, you know, rather than just saying, let's take a depression scale that was, you know, that we've developed here in the States, and just translate it. We we spent a lot of time talking to to people there, and this was done in, in prior studies. So this is where I'm saying there's a long history of of our research in this area, where we'd say, what what does depression mean? How do you define depression? What are symptoms you would think of? And so things that we ne wouldn't necessarily put into a diagno diagnosis of depression, as far as indicators, we we would use what they would put into it rather than what we would put into it, and then make questions based on those indicators. Um, so we did do a lot of, of adaptation. One of my favorite examples uh, when, when we were talking with people there is, um, you know, again, looking at some of the, the uh, work that's been done previously on trauma and, and um, the rates of trauma people experience there, uh, you know, talking to, to locals about their, their traumatic experiences, the symptoms they experience, we'd say, all right, so here's the scale of of uh, traumatic stress that was used in this prior study. Uh, do you have intrusive experiences? Yes, we, we have intrusive experiences. So what does that mean to you? What, what does an intrusive experience mean to you? Which what we're looking for are things like nightmares, flashbacks. And they'd say, well, we have people intrude in our conversations all the time. Like that's, that's not what that question is asking about. So, so I, you know, we found some examples of where 
prior research hasn't done a very good job in, in adapting their measures. Um, but we did put a lot of effort in trying to, to really make sure that we're capturing things in a culturally uh, congruent way. Um, so the, the traumatic stress cycle, yeah, that, that is a, the, the slides that I have are sort of my, my uh, way of describing it. So that's kind of, uh, you know, my, my way of thinking about it. Um, but, but it is really, you know, that is kind of a, a you know, understood uh, the traumatic stress cycle is, is a, a real thing that's, um, you know, there are models of that. I don't know if they, they look exactly like the way that I did it. I, I try to make it, I guess, in, in my sort of simplified way of thinking, I, I always try to think, all right, so how can I make this so I can really follow it? <laughs> so um, so my, my little model that I did is, is maybe a simplified model, but, but yeah, that is a, a, you know, when you think about trauma and how trauma works, the, the more formal DSM does have those categories, you know, of avoidance um, of intrusion, and um, uh, you know the the distress part. Uh, so I don't know if those answered the questions that were asked. I'm trying to see if I missed any that were. Uh, I think those were the ones that came up in chat. It looks like we are at time, but happy to ask, answer other questions if, if there are any. Looks like that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you again for speaking to us about your work. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, it's great to be here and, and see everybody's uh, names on the boxes, even if I don't see your faces. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much again. All right. Thanks. Bye, so everyone. Have a nice evening and happy Halloween. <laughs> <laughs>